So here's my plan, with your permission. Um, today, I will um, <laughs> try, try to finish um, the 14th chapter of the 11th canto. Let's hope I don't get distracted by silly surfing stories or something like that. Um, and then tomorrow, well, <clears throat> we'll see some interesting things, at, um, especially as we get to the end of chapter 14. Um, it is, after all, called um, Krishna instructs Uddhava in the yoga system. So he's teaching him about bhakti yoga with an apparent emphasis on the yoga. But as we'll see, see the real emphasis is on the bhakti. Um, and then tomorrow, um, I want to talk um, specifically about bhakti. Um, how bhakti works, how bhakti finds us. From Vishwana Chakravarti Thakur's Madhurya Kadambini. I touched on this yesterday and I thought it might be a good idea to spend a little time talking about it in more detail. So I have this morning and then tomorrow evening and Friday I'm off. <laughs> It's a treat for me. Swami, we work Swami extra hard. I get to sit back and enjoy. <laughs> I'm officially an old person on Friday, too. <laughs> okay, so um, we left off with texts 18 and 19. Unfortunately, my hearing aids make it possible for me to hear that. <laughs> if I didn't have them, then I wouldn't have heard that. Um, so we'll, start, we'll pick up with text 20. <clears throat> so Krishna has just tell, um, told Uddhava um, about a um, particular feature of, of bhakti that makes it superior to everything else. And now he says, Nasadhayati mam yoga, nasankyam dharma uddhava, naswadhyayas tapastyago yata bhaktir mamorjita. Pretty impressive list of practices here, right? Sadhana, uh, yoga, sankhya, svadhyaya, tapastyaga. All kinds of really cool sounding Sanskrit yogi things. But um, as we'll see, they don't stack up to bhakti. So Krishna says, My dear Uddhava, neither through Ashtanga yoga nor through impersonal monism or an analytical study of the absolute truth, Samkhya, nor through study of the Vedas nor through austerities, charity, or the acceptance of sannyas, can one satisfy me as much as by developing unalloyed devotional service to me. And he continues, being very dear to the devotees and the sadhus, I'm attained through unflinching faith in devotional service. The bhakti yoga system which gradually increases attachment for me, purifies even a human being born among dog eaters. That is to say, everyone can be elevated to the spiritual platform by the process of bhakti yoga. Lucky for us. Um, I sometimes say that I was probably born 
a vegetarian, but I wasn't born in a vegetarian family. <laughs> I never liked meat my whole life, but I was born in a meat-eating family. So dinner time was always a battle. Um, so it's lucky for me that bhakti yoga works, even for those born among dog eaters. I might not have been a dog eater. <laughs> And my family might not have been dog eaters, but they were cow eaters. Um, I often sometimes also joke that I was born in a line of, of cow herds because uh, our family uh, had a dairy farm. Um, I think my great great grandfather started a dairy farm on the California Central Coast. And my father used to tell me, you know, you hear the stories from your parents about how much harder their life was than your life. <laughs> of course, your parents' life was really hard. Uh, they grew up under a communist regime. But, um, and my father grew up during the Great Depression in the 1920s and the 1930s. 1920s, not so bad. 1930s was terrible everywhere in the world. Um, and uh, he used to complain about having to get up at four o'clock in the morning to milk cows and wash bottles, wash milk bottles and things like that. Um, so I was born in a family of cowherds, but the, um, not the best kind of cowherds. Not, like Nanda Maharaj or anyone like that. And my father couldn't get away from the dairy business fast enough. So everyone can be elevated to the spiritual platform by the process of bhakti yoga. And that is our good fortune. Then Krishna says to Uddhava, truthfulness, compassion, religious principles, austerity, and knowledge cannot completely purify a person who's bereft of devotional service to me. These are all wonderful qualities. Truthfulness, compassion, religious principles, austerity, and knowledge. These are very elevated qualities. People whose lives are governed by these things are um, extraordinary people. Everyone looks up to them. And these are very purifying qualities. Even people who come in contact with compassionate people, <clears throat> with truthful people, with religious people, with austere and knowledgeable people. Even people who come in contact with them become purified. But not very much compared with those who come in contact with bhaktas. Um, on two occasions I met uh, Mother Teresa once in 1980, I was, I was stuck alone in the air, airport in New Delhi. I was on my way to Mayapur. We had some sketchy tickets. Does sketchy translate? Sketchy? Sketchy? Um, what sketch? You mean like a bona fide not exactly bona fide. Um, and I had one desire on this trip. One prayer, actually. And I even wrote it in my journal. This one prayer that I not be stuck anywhere alone. Because I really had never... I'd been to Mexico before, but other than that, I'd never been outside the U.S. So I was a little nervous about being stuck alone in India. And uh, 
The very first thing that happened to me in India was that I got stuck alone. Somehow or other, when I went to board my flight to Calcutta, I didn't have a reservation. And all the devotees, and it was hundreds of devotees that poured into the Delhi airport that morning, during the course of the morning, all of a sudden they were all gone. And the whole lobby was empty, and it was just me sitting there trying to figure out what I was going to do next. And then I saw some people coming down a hall, this long hall. And there was three or four men surrounding a very small woman in a white sari. And as she got closer, I realized, oh, that's Mother Teresa. So here I was, an American man in a dhoti and a shaved head, all alone, very conspicuous. I couldn't hide anywhere. Um, and Mother Teresa was approaching. But okay. As shy as I am, I had to step up. And um, so I approached her with my hands folded and I offered a few words of appreciation. And she was very kind. She accepted them. She smiled. We exchanged a few words for a couple, just a couple of minutes. And I could feel this is a powerful person. And it was kind of like, in a sense, kind of like spending a moment with Srila Prabhupada. This is a, I mean, she was a very austere person. Um, and a very religious person. And as far as I knew, a compassionate person. There are stories, but who knows what's true. Um, but what was missing was bhakti. It wasn't quite like being with Srila Prabhupada. It wasn't quite like being with Sripad Narayan Maharaj or with my friend Bodhayan Maharaj or any of the uh, great Vaishnavas that I've known. So these are all wonderful qualities, but without bhakti, they're not very powerful. They're purifying, but only a little. So something's missing. Without the manifestation of ecstatic symptoms of devotional service, such as the hairs standing on end, how can the heart melt? If the heart doesn't melt, how can tears of love flow from the eyes? Without the melting of the heart and without tears flowing from the eyes, how can one render devotional service? And without devotional service, how can the consciousness be purified? And this is Krishna's concern, that our consciousness be purified. A devotee who is fixed in loving service to me, whose voice is sometimes choked up, whose heart melts, who sometimes weeps and sometimes laughs and sometimes chants and dances without concern for others, purifies the three worlds. So someone who has good qualities may purify people who come in contact uh, with them a little bit. But someone who has love for Krishna purifies everyone, purifies the entire universe just by their presence. I was, uh, was thinking how bhakti comes to us, thinking a little bit this morning about how bhakti comes to us. And it, it occurred to me because one devotee had such faith in a suggestion his spiritual master made a couple of times. Once when they first met and once in the last letter that he made. But also apparently other times along the way. Have you heard the story Nayana Nanda Babaji, Das Babaji told? This is in Mula Prakriti's book, Our Srila Prabhupada, Friend to All. One of Prabhupada's godbrothers, Nayana Nanda Das Babaji, whom I met, um, uh, told a story of um, a talk 
uh, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati gave to a gathering of his disciples after those uh, Ban Maharaj and the others came back from India. Uh, I mean, came back from England and Europe. And um, he said, my um, father gave me an instruction, my guru and father gave me an instruction that um, Krishna Bhakti, the science of the Bhagwat, should spread, be spread beyond the shores of India, should be spread all over the world. And my mother, on her deathbed, reminded me of this instruction. Now, this is a Bengali mother. You can imagine a Bengali. Everybody seen Nimai of Nadia? And Nimai comes back to Navadweep, and you hear Sachi Ma's voice. Nimai! Oh my God, it breaks your heart. Nimai! I can't even hear. I mean, I just have to go into the other room sometimes. I can't. It's just. Uh. So here's a Bengali mother on her deathbed, and she says, you remember the instruction your father gave you? You have to make this happen. So Srila Saraswati Thakur said, so far we've had limited success. We sent a party to England and to Europe, and we had very limited success. He says, but I'll tell you this, and then he was looking at, specifically, he was looking right near where Nayan Ananda Das Babaji was sitting. He says, I will tell you this, the next one of you who crosses the ocean will bring back the whole world. And Babaji Maharaj said, at first he thought he was looking at him, and then he realized, he says, sitting, I realized that sitting right in front of me was Abhai Babu. And he says, Srila Prabhupada, I realized Srila Prabhupada had locked eyes with Abhai Babu and he was looking directly at him. And he said, the next one of you come who crosses the ocean will bring back the whole world. Here we are. <laughs> one person had such faith in the order of the spiritual master, just like that um, prayer Srila Govinda Maharaj wrote for Srila Prabhupada, Gaurava Gyam Shirasi Dhritva Shaktiya Vesha Swarupini. Because he took the, or, the order of his spiritual master on his head as, such a, as, a, as, a, as his great burden, he became empowered with the, he became empowered with the Shakti of Lord Nityananda. And he was able to carry Krishna consciousness first to the west and then back to the east. Sometimes devotees, they hear these prayers and they think, well, would Srila Prabhupada be pleased? He said, listen to that prayer. Hare Krishna iti mantra in apastha to prachita. He took the Hare Krishna mantra to the west and then he brought it back to the east. You think Srila Prabhupada wouldn't be pleased with that? Give me a break. Okay, now I'm, I've been distracted. If we make it to the end of the chapter, it'll be a miracle. <laughs> Krishna continues, just as the gold, when smelted in fire, gives, us, gives up its impurities and returns to its brilliant pure brilliant state, the spirit soul absorbed in the fire of bhakti yoga is purified of all contamination caused by previous fruitive activities and as a result becomes situated in his constitutional position as my eternal servant. If a diseased eye is smeared with medicinal ointment, it can gradually recover its lost ability to see. Similarly, the more a living entity becomes purified by hearing and chanting the narrations of my auspicious glories, the more he can perceive my transcendental form. Here's our medicine. Right? This is our medicine. And then it becomes our food. This is, we feast on it. First it's medicine, we 
you take it assiduously. Take it in our doses every day, hearing Srimad Bhagavatam in the morning, chanting our, chanting our job of going to the regular kirtans, and after a while, we can't get enough. Uh, so the more they hear and chant the narrations, and the more they can perceive my transcendental form. The mind of a person who meditates on the objects of the senses becomes entangled in such, such objects. But if one constantly remembers me, then his mind becomes absorbed in me. And then, some prescription. One should give up all paths for material elevation, which are no better than the creations of a dream. One should rather absorb his mind in always thinking of me, for this will completely purify him of all material contamination. One who is aware of his eternal self should give up the association of women and those who are attached to women and fearlessly sit down in a solitary place to carefully meditate on me. Now, if you're a woman, this means men and people who are attached to men. If you're gay, that means people who are, you know, you know, you know what the deal is. In other words, the objects of the senses, because this is a very entangling, we know this is a very entangling business. And we regulate it, you know, by having monogamous committed relationships. You know, and, and that um, takes some of the thrill, I guess, the adventure out of it. You don't hear the violins and, and tambourines. There was a movie when I was young called uh, Steve McQueen and Natalie Wood's movie, Love with the Perfect Stranger. <laughs> and one of the themes was, you know, when you fall in love, you hear violins and tambourines. And at the very end of the movie, there was Steve McQueen and Natalie Wood standing in an intersection in New York City, right in the crosswalk in the middle of the street. And there were violins and tambourines and the camera was swirling around and they were falling in love. <laughs> of course, I think he hired musicians because he was a part of the musicians union or something like that. Um, and then it becomes the kind of falling in love to the daily business of loving each other and helping each other, um, you know, love Krishna more and more each day. And this works when we do it, we see it, it, uh, it actually works. Um, but otherwise, we need to, um, you know, we need to be able, if you can't do that, then you need to go to a cave. You just got, got to find a cave. <laughs> but actually, Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur says, actually it's Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur who says, that it's really only possible to do this by engaging in Sharanagati, by engaging in surrender to Krishna. And then Krishna continues, all kinds of distress and bondage, of all the kinds of distress and bondage, none is greater than the suffering and bondage arising from the intimate association with the opposite sex and with those who are attached to the opposite sex. And Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur makes a very interesting observation here. He says, the association of lusty men can be even more dangerous than association with women. Because it's all, they're always you know, talking about this. Um, I was raised by a lusty man. My father is 93 years old, and he, just maybe three months ago, he got married for the fourth time. <laughs> My brother and I wish him well. We just want Dad to be happy. <laughs> but for Pete's sake. <laughs> uh, but I grew up with that man. And I remember being five or six years old, riding around with my father and my dad saying, hey Billy, look at that one. <laughs> what chance in the world did I have? <laughs> okay. 
So, how did this happen? <laughs> <laughs> then Uddhava asks Krishna, my dear lotus eyed Krishna, please describe to me how one who desires liberation should meditate upon you. On which form should he meditate and what should be the nature of his meditation? Here it comes, boys and girls. Fasten your seat belts. The Supreme Personality of Godhead said, while seated on a level seat that is not too high, I don't know, <laughs> or too low, keeping the body straight and yet comfortable, placing the hands on one's lap, focusing the eyes on the tip of the nose, uh, one should purify the pathways of breathing by practicing the mechanical exercises of Puraka, Kumbhaka, and Rechaka, <coughs> and then reversing the procedure. You guys have this down, right? Just This is part of our, you get up in the morning and you do the yeah. Puraka, Kumbhaka, and Rechaka, no sweat. <laughs> Having fully controlled the senses, one should thus practice pranayama. One should raise the life air upwards to the heart where the sacred syllable om can be heard like the sound of a bell. One should then continue raising the sacred syllable upwards until it is joined with the anusvara vibration. Anusvara is a, a nasal. Mm. You can end all the 15 vowels of the Sanskrit alphabet. Ah, 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 e, e. So it can ah, um, ah. Um. Anyway, you can do all that stuff. Um, Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur uh, admits in his commentary on this verse, the complete explanation of this process is extremely complicated and it is obviously not suitable for this age. <laughs> In other words, boys and girls, don't try this at all. <laughs> the Omkara thus being joined, one should carefully practice the pranayama system of yoga ten times at each sunrise, noon, and sunset. Well, we've been given something a little easier to do with the sun is, right? If we could just kind of focus our attention on a few mantras for seven, eight minutes, then that might do. By doing so, after one month, one will have conquered the life air. Seatbelt time. Keeping the eyes half closed and fixed on the tip of the nose and being wide awake and alert. No snoozing. One should meditate on the lotus flower that is situated within the heart which has eight petals and an erect stalk. One should meditate on the sun, moon, and fire, placing them one after another within the whorl of that lotus flower. Then, placing my transcendental form within the fire, one should meditate on it as the auspicious goal of meditation. That transcendental form, now, this is a, a, a description that's very like the descriptions that we see elsewhere as the goal of meditation in the Bhagavatam, like with Dhruva Maharaj, Narada Muni's instructions to Dhruva Maharaj in the fourth canto, right? That transcendental form is perfectly proportioned, gentle and cheerful, and has four long arms, beautiful shoulders, a handsome forehead, a pure smile, and ears that are decorated with shark-shaped earrings. That spiritual form has a complexion that resembles that of a new rain cloud and is dressed in gold and yellowish garments. The chest of that form is the abode of Srivatsa and Lakshmi and is decorated with a conch shell, disc, club, and lotus flower. That form of mine is decorated with a garland of forest flowers. The lotus feet are decorated with ankle bells and this form exhibits the Kostuba gem and an effulgent crown. The upper hips are beautified by a golden belt and the arms are decorated with valuable bracelets. All of the limbs of this beautiful form captivate the heart and the face is beautified by merciful glancing. Withdrawing the senses from their sense objects, one should be grave and self-controlled 
and should use his intelligence to fix his mind on all the limbs of my transcendental body. Thus, one should meditate on that most delicate trans transcendental form of mind. And the Sanskrit is, um, is so um, nice. You hear so many, you know, if you read through the Sanskrit, there's so many familiar words, but we don't have the time. Thereafter, one should withdraw the mind from the limbs of that transcendental form and fix it on the wonderful smiling face of the Lord. So we concentrate on the whole form of the Lord and then we uh, sharpen our focus on the Lord's wonderful smiling face. Thereafter, one should withdraw the mind which had been firmly fixed on the lotus face of the Lord and establish it in the sky, which is the cause of the gross cosmic manifestation. Huh? Finally, one should relinquish that meditation as well and become fixed in me thus giving up the process of meditation all together. And it all comes back to this, right? Just love me. That's what it's all about. Forget the hokey pokey. That's what it's all about. Give up that meditation as well and become fixed in me, thus giving up the process of meditation altogether. One who has fixed his mind on me should see me within his own self, should see the individual soul within me, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. He should see how he is situated within the Lord, just like rays of the sun are seen as united with the sun. When the yogi carefully controls his mind by complete absorption and meditation, his false identification with material objects, mundane knowledge, and fruit of activities is soon dispelled. So we see instructions like this throughout the 11th canto. Um, I mean, already. We're only seven chapters in to the 11th canto. And several places we've seen instructions like this. We should see the self within the, the Lord and the Lord within the self. And there are all sorts of kinds of sankhya that we have to engage in and, and, and meditations that are, in, that are given. And it, it always comes back to this. Just fix your mind in me. Whatever it is, let that go and just fix your mind in me. Just as Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, he goes through, he argues with Arjuna from so many different angles of vision. And then he says, but really, just love me. That's, I know that stuff's all kind of, it's hard to wrap your mind around, so just forget it, love me. Take shelter in me, forget everything else, and I'll take care of everything. Masu Masu Chaha. Masu Chaha. No worry, Nadia. And that's it. That's the whole 14th chapter right there. It ends as so far as these chapters have so far. It all ends in, um, as Prabhupada says somewhere earlier, in, somewhere in the first canto, I think, bhakti unto Vasudev. I remember this phrase from, I don't even know how long ago, I remember reading that and I said, that's a kind of far out sounding, phrase. bhakti unto Vasudev. But really it all amounts to that. So we have, I mean, he gives this elaborate process, but really, um, when we look at the process of bhakti yoga, 
It's actually something that's very practical. But uh, Srila Rupa Goswami uh, outlines 64 main angas. There are other practices as well. But 64 main angas of sadhana bhakti in Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu. And then, well, they all add up to 64 when he emphasizes five of them at the end. And I don't remember how the verse from Bhakti Rasamrita to Sindhu goes. But when Lord Chaitanya, when Krishna Das Kaviraj has Lord Chaitanya instructing Sanatan Goswami in the 64 Angas of Bhakti in the 22nd chapter of Matilila in Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita, he says, uh, Sadhu Sangha Nam Kirtan Bhagavat Shravan Maturavas Sri Murtira Shraddhaya Seva. Sadhu Sangha, associating with um, elevated devotees. Sadhu Sangha, and Srila Rupa Goswami describes Sadhu Sangha in Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu as devotees who, you know, sadhus, so they're elevated, they're devotees who are advanced. Um, Asajatiya Sisnigdasya. They share our mood, they're from the same group, and they're affectionately disposed. That's who we should associate with. Um, uh, Sadhu Sangha, Nam Kirtan, chanting the holy names. People just like that. People like singing. When I was a kid back in the late 50s and 60s, the, one of the popular culture uh, crazes was folk music. And one of the features of folk music, especially as it was um, introduced by one of, one of my own heroes, Pete Seeger, um, was singing, sing, was the sing-along. Uh, Pete Seeger would have, you know, he would have the audience, I mean, everybody who went to a Pete Seeger concert knew the songs he was going to sing. He did, usually didn't sing a new song. They knew the songs he was going to sing, and he wanted them to sing along. And they were, the, the concerts were usually overbooked. There were more people than the venue would hold. So there, were always, there was always a large part of the audience right up there on the stage with Mr. Seeger. Right up there on the stage. So it was just, it was a big old hoot nanny, big old sing-along. And um, so, and, and people like that. You know, people just, people like that. You go to, even you go to rock concerts, you know, and there's, there's always this, there's always some kind of favorite number where, where the star, you know, cues the audience, you know, now it's your turn to sing along in the chorus or, you know, some fav you know, whatever the, some f favorite word in the song is or something like that. Um, so people love that. And on its surface, that's what kirtan is. It's call and response, sing along, we get into it. But it's more than that because it's Krishna's names, songs about Krishna's names, songs about Krishna's beauty, songs about uh, Krishna's wonderful qualities, songs about Krishna's pastimes. And when we get a taste for that, then it's more than just a sing-along. It's our hearts singing along. And when, the, when there's a good kirtan, you can feel that. Um, you can feel that in the kirtan. And sometimes you can feel that even in recordings. I have one recording of my friend Badahari leading a kirtan at a Sadhu Sangha retreat a couple of years ago. I wasn't there. But this one kirtan, um, I told Badahari, this kirtan, it doesn't just open my heart, it breaks my heart open. It's so wonderful. Um, Badahari's kirtans are like that. Three of my favorite kirtan singers are, are uh, Badahari, Agni Dev, and uh, Achyuta Gopi. Achyuta Gopi just has such a powerful voice, and she is so. Um, she grew up a devotee of Radha Govinda, and she's just all about Radha Govinda. She grew up in the Radha Govinda Temple in Brooklyn, New York, and she's very small person with a very big voice, very, very powerful voice. And she just leads wonderful kirtans, 
full of heart. And, um, and, and Agni Dave's kirtans are just, each kirtan is an ocean of sweetness. It's a small ocean because he'll only sing the same tune. He'll sing a tune for 15, maybe 18, maybe 20 minutes, and then he'll change tunes. Because he wants to, wants a variety, wants to share a variety of tunes. One time at New Vrindavan last year, he went for almost half an hour with one tune. And I said, Agni, that was almost half an hour. He said, I don't know what happened. <laughs> that won't carry your way. Um, so, Sadhu Sangha, Nam Kirtan, Bhagavad Shravan, just what we're doing here. Um, hearing about the glories of the Lord. Um, Mathura Vas, living in a holy place like Vrindavan or Mathura, Mayapur, Audarya, Madhuvan, even um, Srila Pra. You know, some people think that means taking up residence there for the rest of your life. But in nectar devotion, Prabhupada says, means, you know, live there for six months or a month or even a couple of weeks. Spend some time there. Um, immerse yourself in the atmosphere of the holy town. And that atmosphere means, well, it means an atmosphere of service. And Sri uh, Murtir Shodhaya Seva, um, um, serving the uh, deity form of the Lord with um, love and faith, um, giving our heart to Krishna in that way. Um, and these are easy things. They're a heck of a lot easier than sitting on a seat that's not too high or too low. Well, sitting on a seat that's just right, like uh, Goldilocks, and sitting comfortably with your hands on your lap, that's okay. But the whole staring at the tip of your nose and the pranayama thing and establishing a lotus on an erect stalk in your heart with the fire and the whatever, all those other things, that's a little much. Um, that's a little much for us. Um, we can, um, can hardly st you know, stand the idea of spending a week somewhere where there's no internet. <laughs> um, but, uh, but if we can spend a week where um, we're immersed in, in, in sadhu sangha, in hearing and chanting about Krishna, in, in associating with Giriraj and Gaur Nittai, um, and, uh, you know, and all the wonderful activities that the devotees have organized for us here. Um, I mean, that's life. What else is there? That's easy. We can do that. And, um, and if we can bring that back to the rest, of, you know, the rest of our life, the other 51 weeks of the year, and then share what we get here with, other, you know, with the other devotees that we have contact with, the devotees who weren't um, fortunate enough to come spend this week with us here. Um, then, then that's a wonderful thing. That's bhakti yoga. Um, we don't necessarily have to go, to, to go find the cave to run away from the opposite sex <laughs> and, um, you know, and, and cut, our, cut ourselves off from the world. We can, immerse, we can immerse ourselves in the world without being part of the world because we'll be sharing what we got here with the world. That's why we're there. I know sometimes when I used to teach, the best, the best part of, uh, of, of teaching was when I used to get to sneak a little, because I am a naughty boy. I admitted that yesterday. Um, when I used to get, a, get to sneak a little Krishna consciousness in, there was a, one thing I would do the very first day of class when we would read the syllabus. And there was a, uh, a thing we used to have to include in, we have to include in the syllabus um, to make uh, everyone in the class feel um, 
comfortable and included. So there were, no, you know, we wanted to make sure that no one would be discriminated against either by the uh, professor or by the students because of, uh, because of sex or sexual preference or gender or race, religion, whatever. So I would read through, you know, when we would read through the syllabus, I would get to this part and I would just say, look, everyone has to feel comfortable in my classes. Now, we, we generally, we can tell who's, uh, who, who's black and white, who's a man and a woman, although nowadays that's less the case. Um, I'm my best friend from high school, you can't tell. My best friend from high school is transgender, but, um, uh, you don't always know who's liberal or conservative, who's a Republican or Democrat, who's Catholic or uh, Baptist or Jewish or Muslim. Uh, we might even have a Hare Krishna in this room. You don't know. And so it'd give me a chance to say Hare Krishna. And then at the end of the semester, um, I would always bring Mahaprasad. I would make uh, sweets at the end of the semester. End of the spring semester, I would make chocolate chip cookies and I would offer a mound of chocolate chip cookies <coughs> to my Takrajis as part of my puja that morning. The whole mound would be offered. So everything was Mahaprasadam. It wasn't like some students got Mahaprasadam and some students got mini prasadam. You know? <laughs> Everybody got Mahaprasadam. And at the end of the fall semester, because it's Christmas time and fudge is a Christmassy thing, I would make fudge. And, uh, and I would distribute Mahaprasad to my students. And also at the faculty meetings, we would you know, have a department meeting at the end of the semester and I would always bring prasadam to those, to those meetings and try to, try to see if I could make those poor people fortunate. Um, so that's what we do. We, ta we, you know, we get what we can when we have time to spend together, and then we share that with everyone, everyone we can the rest of the year. And that's bhakti yoga, and it's a lot easier than this, this other thing, because that's what Krishna ends up with when we get to the end of this chapter. He goes through this whole elaborate rigmarole, and then he says, and then forget all that, let it all go, and just love me, because that's really what it is all about. Does anyone have anything? I have one question, um, because uh, as uh, you mentioned, um, Krishnadas uh, Goswami, uh, repeats at the Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu talking about these five most important angas of Bhakti. Mm -hmm. And I remember last year Guru Maharaj said that uh, uh, what is Brindavan or what is Matura, that this is the state of the mind. So it's not necessarily means that you have to go there, visit every year, but that the state of your consciousness. Um, is it sometimes even more important than visiting the places? Because the places are also under the changes. Mm -hmm. The places do undergo the change. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. My question is about the five most important and bhakti, czyli takich procesów bhakti, o których Maharaj wspominał, cytując Krishnadasa Kaviraja Goswamiego, a ten z kolei sięgając do, do bhakti rasamita sindhu rupy Goswamiego. I wśród nich jest jedna z ang, która, którą możemy przetłumaczyć jako mieszkanie w okręgu matury. I tak jak Maharaj powiedział, można się udawać tam na przykład raz na 6 miesięcy albo raz na w jakimś większych odstępach czasu, ale w ubiegłym roku Dokładnie um, Krishna Karana ma to pytał Guru Maharaja i Maharaj odpowiedział, że, vrind, że Vrindava to jest stan świadomości, a nie jak gdyby sam miejsce w takim geograficznym znaczeniu. Is there a Bhagavad Gita on the table? Uh, yes. Is it wrapped? Yeah. Is it a Ale czy jest Is it Polish, Maharaj? Oh. 
Polish. It's in Polish? Polish. <laughs> Maybe next time. <laughs> there is there is a footnote. I don't remember. Uh, I'm trying to remember where it is. There is a footnote in Bhagavad Gita, it's feeling and philosophy, where Swami addresses exactly that point, mm -hmm. that Mathura is a state of consciousness. Um, I'll, uh, I'll try to find that. I have a PDF on my iPad. It's harder to find it. I'm much more adept at analog books than digital yeah, books. Okay. At, uh, at navigating them, but I'll try to find that. But that's yeah, that's that's a, it's a wonderful point, and uh, that's a point that he makes in a in a footnote when he's talking about Mathura somewhere in Bhagavad Gita. I'll try I'll, I'll try to find that. And, and if we were online, I would. Put it in the Sri Chaitanya Sangha group and on top of Vivek, but uh, maybe I can do that when we get back Saturday. Thanks. Good one. Thank you. Does anyone have anything else? Yeah. Both things are there. Now, if we go to Vrindavan or Mathura now, I've heard it may be very easy to be distracted. Because now it's really crowded. They have internet, TV, all kinds of things. Even a, um, we heard the other night, liquor shop. Govinda's liquor shop. Really? <laughs> Pardon? In Mathura, maybe, not in Vrindavan. Oh, in Mathura. Oh, I, I, we, someone told us in Vrindavan. <laughs> I mean, my understanding was that liquor was completely outlawed in Vrindavan proper. And I, I can accept that that might have changed. Because so many, I mean, they paved the Parikram Marg. They, building bridges and so many things. Um, last time I was there, you'll be shocked, was 1982. So across the road from um, Krishna Balaram Mandir, it was just empty fields. And they would put up stalls there during festival time. Now I guess it's a mall or something. Um, and there are cars everywhere, um, I hear. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know if I would recognize the place at all. Um, and I'm not sure I'm transcendental enough that I would be able to um, Really see, so it's it's probably it might be a little difficult. Um, I mean, I know someone who went to Vrindavan, went to India for the first time a couple of years ago, and she was just thrilled. I mean, it was, as far as it was Vrindavan, you know, and uh, she was just stoked. But um, you know, those of us who used to go back, go there when Raman Reti was forest and sand, and little homes and. You know, like that little Hunuman temple along the side of the road and stuff like that. And there was danger of dacoits and stuff. Now it's just uh, real estate mafia instead of dacoits that you have to worry about. So it's a little different. So some, it might be easier. And Guru Maharaj, I think, sometimes emphasizes this. Um, 
uh, that we should try to create uh, Matura Vrindavan in, in our hearts. And that we should create a Matura consciousness um, in our minds. And so he is always happy to invite devotees to visit Madhuvan, um, especially um, when he's there, because he likes, he likes company, he likes to take devotees around, he likes to take them to Carrillo Beach, <laughs> uh, lovely beach. Um, and, uh, um, and, and show off the development that's happened there. And sometimes he'll tell you just exactly the, the difference. You know, I mean, it was wild when, when, when he discovered that place, when, when uh, uh, Juan and Don Imel showed, you know, first showed him that place. And uh, even when I first went there in 2008, the difference between then and now is huge. It's huge. I mean, we <laughs> could hardly get up the road. Yeah. Um, so, um, you know, and then there's also Sargrahi, which he's, he, he's more than happy to show off to devotees. Um, just a lovely, beautiful property um, in a lovely setting, the mountains of western North Carolina. And then there's our Darya in the middle of the Redwoods in Northern California. Um, and especially when the devotees are there doing what we're doing now, the, the atmosphere is wonderfully transcendental. And there are cows. We had cows briefly this morning, but there are cows all the time there. <laughs> Anything else? Thank you once again.